first, I'd like to thank whoever the organization was who got me in here to talk to you guys. Because they don't usually let characters of my stature on, like, you know, college campuses. And stuff. So whoever did that, and they did it because I'm here. Let's give them a round of applause. This will be fun. Um, I've been doing this stuff for a few years, about three years, going around. I started out speaking at uh, elementary school. Well, really, I started actually speaking in schools because there was a point where when we were making music, they wouldn't play our records on the radio, and we felt so foolish going into different cities and going to the radio station and sitting and doing interviews with people who didn't have our records in the studio. It was like, talking to us like, yeah, your new jam is, be like, fuck you, you know, it's like, why are we here? So we came up with another way, we said, let's just go into the cities and go to the record stores where the kids that are buying the records can come, and let's try to do something positive and go into the schools. So we started going to the elementary schools and moved on to junior highs. Before I was knew, knew it, I was doing colleges, and I graduated from colleges to penitentiaries. We talked there too, so. <laughs> And believe that that's a harder audience than you guys. <laughs> so, first thing I want to do is you guys have to prepare what we're getting ready to indulge in. This is going to be a very hardcore conversation with me. Uh, you guys are college, you know, this is college, so you guys are ready for it. I, I change the way I speak when I talk to different age groups, but you guys are grown, so we're going to get off into it and we're going to use a lot of hardcore words. They have this term right now in our English language called profanity. You know, which is bullshit, basically. Profanity, if you look it up in a di dictionary, it says something which is blasphemous. If you look up blasphemy, it says something which is irreverent. So right now I'm gonna challenge any of you educated people to tell me how the word shit is gonna send me to hell. It cannot. The only word that could be considered blasphemous would be God damn it if it was using the sentence God be damned, which would be in some kind of ritual which we're not gonna perform here tonight. <laughs> So, they're shit fuck, bitch, dick, pussy, asshole. Those are not profane words. Those are slang. Those are slangs that bothered somebody at some point in time. So what your mother did was tell you if you said that she lied. You can't go to hell from saying fuck. Fuck wasn't even around back when they was making up this movie. So get over it. You know, we got problems with these words. This is a personal problem that you've been indoctrinated with since you were a little kid. You know, and you gotta get over this shit because there's more real things in the world going on than the fact that these words bother you. I'm sorry. Now that we got over that, we're a little bit prepared on which direction we're gonna go here. A lot of you guys... <laughs> never seen myself in hand language before. This is, a, <laughs> this is a first. This is fly. I mean, I'm moving up. <laughs> I'm just like bugging, really. There's a hand line for bugging? Well, I'm bugging. Some of you people in here know me from rap. Other people know me from movies. Some of you might know me from stuff like Body Count. Uh, some of you heard of me during the cop killer controversy but have no idea what I really do. Some of you might have read the book. I don't know where, but what I'll do is just kind of like take you through a quick lifeline of Ice T so we can get an understanding of where I come from and maybe where some of my ideas come from. I was born in Newark, New Jersey, on the East Coast, and, and of course everybody knows Newark, New Jersey is on the East Coast. I ramble, so this, sometimes I just talk like a normal person. <laughs> I was born in, in Newark, New Jersey. My mother passed when I was in the seventh grade. At, uh, no, my mother passed when I was in the third grade. My father died when I was in the seventh grade. 
And at that point, I was moved to Los Angeles to live with my aunt. My aunt had already raised her children, and this wasn't a very productive household for me to be in. I just had to be there. My aunt was my father's older sister, and she was a social worker who, who slash alcoholic, who had a job that was, she would determine which children would go into which foster homes, but she was a raving lunatic and a full-blown alcoholic. And then early in that part of my life, it made me really question authority, like, how could this lady have this job when she's so messed up, you know? So I'm, I'm going through, uh, I went to Palms Junior High School in Los Angeles, which is a bus, I was bus from a middle-class black uh, area in Los Angeles called View Park, upper middle class, and then I moved, I went to Palm Junior High, which is a white school in Culver City. Everything was cool there, but then when I got to high school, I decided I wanted to go to Crenshaw High School, which was about less than a mile away, but I would have to walk to that school. Crenshaw High School was an all-black high school. The only people white there were the teachers, and that was it, 100% black. There was one Mexican kid there, and the whole school was black. And I went there dealing with kids who had never really seen a white person outside of a teacher up close. There's white neighborhoods that, you know, they don't see black people unless they're watching them on videos. If you go like the, the middle, up in the Ozarks and shit, they don't, one's free, you know. There are some other <laughs> But, I'm going to school over there, and that's where I was introduced to the gangs. I went, was introduced to the, the gangs, the gangs that I was mostly affiliated with when I was going to high school, Crenshaw. For those of you who don't know about Los Angeles, my school is like the most central school in Los Angeles. It's evenly between the west, east, north, and south of Los Angeles. If you took a, a map of LA and stuck a pin down through the center of Los Angeles, you'd come probably through the quad at Crenshaw High School. So it had like, the, the, the east side of Los Angeles, which was considered more rowdy, and the west side was more, a little bit more fly, we thought. It was even, it had it all. We had the pretty girls and we had some ugly girls. It was like a, a pretty balanced school. I was introduced to the gangs and um, affiliated with the Crip gang, Rolling 60 Crips, Harlem Crips, uh, and the Hoover Crips, uh, which were blue. And, you know, the brims were red. Now, when I say affiliated with the Crips, that means I never was jumped into a gang. I was never what would be considered a hardcore gang member because I never actually went out and did work. Work is murder. I never actually engaged in that, but I rolled with the set. I wore the colors, but I wasn't really in it for that. I was in it more for the family side of gang membership, which was by me not having a family, dealing with guys, and the first person ever really used the word love to me was another brother who told me, yo, you know, I love you, and ain't nothing ever gonna happen to you. Now, gang membership is a little different than you see on television, but I call it in my book, male, male love push to its, you know, to, to, to the pinnacle. It can't be pushed any farther. I don't know if any one of you have ever had somebody look you in the face and say, nothing is ever gonna happen to you in your life, and if anything ever does happen, we will retaliate. You never worry about that. I got your back. It's something that you wish your mother and father would say to you. It's something you wish the girl would wish your boyfriend would say to you. You know, I'm not one of those people like that are very much into letting life take its course. I mean, if I ever get shot, my last words, if you roll, roll me over, I say, what was ISIS's last words? It won't be peace on earth. It'll be like, get them motherfuckers. You know, it's like. <laughs> Fuck that. That's, I mean, that's how I am, and I'm gonna explain why I don't like that, but I don't. Peace, let them live. Fuck that. Find them. So I went to Crenshaw High School. Um, I, when I was in the 12th grade, I got my girlfriend pregnant, who was in the 10th grade, and we had a child. Uh, she didn't really want to have a child, but I, I wanted to have a child because I didn't have any family, and um, which made me a teen parent, so I know a whole lot about that. 
I got out of high school and I went into trade school because I wanted to get in. I liked working on cars. I, I thought that was where I wanted to go. But by me being on my own, I left my aunt's house when I was 17 because it was, I wasn't feeling any love there. And I had Social Security check, $250 a month. I got my own pad. I had got, I would take $100 a month and spend that on the pad. And another 100 I had for food. The other $50 I, I used for whatever else. I, I was had my own pad when I was in the 12th grade. So I was like the most popular kid in the school because I had my own crib. I think y'all understand, in the 12th grade, having your own pad can make you really popular. You know, but I, but I maxed out. I started doing well in, in school. But crime was just right around the corner. It was like I found out that if I could break into somebody's BMW and steal a car radio, which I could sell for $250, I could double my income. Two radios, I was moving on up. So I started getting into that, but I did have a child. I decided I was going to attempt to do something responsible, and I joined the military. I did four years in the military, uh, and I was a ranger. For any of you guys know about Army. No. You're just a bigger dummy when you're a ranger. <laughs> you know, you join the army, the object is to get to the Pentagon and where they don't shoot, right? <laughs> when you get in there, you don't pick shit that puts you closer to the front line unless you're fucking nuts. First off, you don't know who you're fighting. Fuck. So I went into the military and I really learned a lot about this country from the inside. I mean, I, I did what I call two years in and two years out. Uh, two years just going in, doing all the army shit, you know, trying to, to be hardcore, represent, I got a kid. And then when I got in there, I realized I'm, I'm training myself to die or get killed, and I didn't really want to do that. So I did two years out. And when you get in the military, in order to get out without getting busted, you have to act like you're not trying to get out to the very last minute. And then you get out. So I had my corporal stripes when I got out. But any of y'all ever go into the military, you know, people say, well, is there anything you learned good from the military? You learn discipline. You learn how to control yourself. You learn a lot of things. But you can also learn that in the penitentiary. There's not anything you're going to learn in the Army that you can't learn in jail. So the place to be is in college and teach this shit to yourself. Don't force it on it. Laying on a mountain in Chuchan, Korea, 30 below zero is not going to build character. It's going to get you frostbite. <laughs> so I'm in there. I, I, at one point, I was an RTO for a lieutenant. An RTO is a cat that carries the radio for the lieutenant. And you would hear during uh, maneuvers when we would train and go against the Marines and the RTAPs and things of that nature, they would say, send first platoon onto that ridge line to draw fire. Y'all y'all want to draw fire? You know what draw fire means? That means go send them on the hill to see which way they shoot at them from. I ain't drawing fucking fire. And I always said, who is the dude on the other end of that radio, right? He's safe. That's what I mean, you know. I'm not no anti-military. I'm just anti-fighting somebody I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna go to war. I'm gonna go to war with somebody that beat up my girlfriend or something. I'm not going to war with some motherfuckers. I don't know nothing. Like, fuck that. <laughs> so I'm in there, and I come home out of the military with a firm belief that I am not going to take another order again in my life. Because you take four years of orders and stuff. I was even given orders at one point. I was. I was, I was a cold cat. I used to break in newbies and shit, talk crazy to them. Like, yeah, yeah. Ain't gonna do nothing. If I, if I kill you right now, they'll do nothing but stick some more needles in my head, and then I'll be back here tomorrow. Here. <laughs> Push up Missouri. I was doing some crazy things. I was like, I, this ain't for me. Okay. So when I got home from the military, I said, well, you know, I'm gonna do the right thing. But what happened was my small time criminal friends now were big time criminals. And they picked me up from the airport, new vets and Mercedes Benzes, and hey, Ice, man, you back here, you back, you back. I'm like, so what's happening on the streets? Oh, we doing this, we doing that, man. You should come on and get down, man. You get down with us. 
That day, I left. I went to Palm Springs and we robbed a jewelry store. I had a quarter of a million dollars the day after I got out of the military. I was like, this is what life is about. So I, I started robbing jewelry stores and doing a whole bunch of other crimes. And we moved through all the 50 states. One of my boys who got caught was busted. He had 52 aliases at the time when they finished and held him down for when they figured out who he was, because there's a lot of way to beat the system, and at that time, they didn't have the way they could run their prints throughout the system at the speed. So if, I, if you got busted up here in Washington, and I guess, and you say, yo, I've never done anything before, and you can add, give them an alias, and we can get you a bail, you'd be out before they knew who the fuck you were, and then you'd be out of the state, and then the FBI had to chase you, but they didn't know where you started from, and we was moving, and we were terrorizing the United States. Uh, what happened was that, went into other things and other things. Eventually, I had to get out of that game. I was involved with the pimp game. I pimped for two and a half, three years, for real. Not like I'm a pimp, you know. <laughs> We're talking about real prostitutes selling pussy, and you take all the money. That's what pimping is. Some guys, I'm a pimp. They're not pimps. They're managers. They got their girlfriend bringing them a little home because she strips. That's not pimping. I'm not saying I'm proud of it, but it prepared me for this business world that I was soon getting ready to come off into. And I learned that there's only one game out there, which is the people that work and the people that have you work for them. And that's the basis of all, of all business. Um, I'm minding my business, hustling my ass off, and rap came out. Rap was a, a, a little thing. I used to make gang slogans when I was in the gang. This is pre-rap. I'm, I'm making gang slogans. Like, let me see if I can see how what a what a gang. Like, uh, strolling through the city in the middle of the middle of the night. Niggas on my left and niggas on my right, yelling cut cut cut. Rip every nigga I see. If you bad enough, come fuck with me. I seen another nigga. I said crip again. He said fuck a crip. Nigga, this is brown. So he pulled out the Roscoe's. Roscoe said crap. I looked again, nigga was shooting back, so he fell to the ground, aimed for his head, one more shot, nigga was dead. So we walked over to him, took his gun, spit in his face, and began to run. So if you see another nigga laying dead in the street in a puddle of blood from his head to his feet, hope it's time all you busters get hip. It's fuck a brim, nigga, it's west side, who for cover it? Now that's a gang rhyme, that has nothing to do with rap. So I'm, I'm, I'm knowing how to do this, but at the same time, my lifestyle had changed from the gang thing, so Rap came out, so I flipped over Rapper's Delight and I started to rhyme. But my rhymes weren't like, throw your hands in the air. <laughs> the only time we said throw your hands, we was robbing motherfuckers. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? This is how I'm doing it, you know, hoes, I got money, bitch, whoop -dee whoop whoop, beat the bitch down. <laughs> now, the way I would get the way I could get on the mic, we would go into the clubs and my boys would pay off the DJ. The DJ be spinning, they'd be like, you know, man wanna rap? They'd be like, no rappers. A man hands hundred dollars. I'm on the mic all night. I got the mic, I'm talking, saying what I want. I'm, I'm insulting people, people are, but, but always it was a group of people in the audience that felt me, the hustlers. They was like, yeah, yeah, he's talking about us. So what happened was I started moving around LA and I was known as, the L.A. player, Ice-T's gonna come in and talk that player stuff. And by mistake, not knowing what I was doing, I invented this form of rap called Gangster Rap with a song called Six in the Morning. That was like the first record that people call Gangster Rap. If you wanna really check for a fossil, find my record I did in 1982 called The Coldest Rap, where I was talking about cocaine and stuff. I mean, like. I'm a player, that's all I know on a summer day, I play in the snow. How you gonna play in the snow on a summer day? We was like, so I was, I said I, would, I, was, I said I had so many clothes in my wardrobe each day, when I put some in, I gotta throw some away. I was talking fly shit, and girls was loving this shit. And we were talking dirty, nasty shit. And I was like, well, the girls like this dirty type rhyme. And at the same time, up in uh, Oakland, there was a kid named Too Short who was doing the same thing, doing freaky tales on tapes. So what I did is I finally worked my way to this club called The Radio, and these cats came in and they walked in and they said, we're gonna make a movie. Movie, movie was called Breaking with Shabadoo and Boogaloo Shrimp. Now a lot of y'all 
remember me in breaking and I had on the leather. <laughs> but before you laugh, I want you to show me a picture of what the fuck you wore when you were <laughs> You know you had on that Michael Jackson jacket, <laughs> parachute pants, and them boots. And you was jocking the leather I had on on the stage. Yo, this is back in the day. I mean, I can't front. I was still doing my thing back then. He was jocking. So um, I make this movie called Breaking, which basically some cats walked into the club and said, you're going to be the rapper. You'll be the DJ. We'll take these kids right here and make the, rap make the movie. They came to me to be in a movie. I didn't even want to be in a movie. I was like, I'm hustling, man. I ain't got no time. We're going to give you $500 a day. I fucked that off on sneakers, man. I'm not trying to be in no bullshit movie, man. I'm a hustler. So they came at me, but my boys at this time were going to prison. All my friends were going to prison. They were catching life sentences and other things because this game eventually runs out. And they would tell me, they said, Ice, man, you should go on and do this movie, man. You got a chance, man. White people like you, man. Now that's a strange statement, but what that means is white people don't like them. But I always had this vibe, this, this aura that allowed me to get places they couldn't. And they, they knew something I didn't know. So I went off into the movie Breaking reluctantly, and I made a record called Reckless, which, which kind of like sold a lot of records. And that was my first real check I had ever got from a real job. And I was impressed with it, even though Glove jerked me. Glove took like most of the money and gave me a little chip. Like the check was like 80 something thousand. He gave me like five thousand dollars, but I still knew there was an eighty thousand dollar check. I'm like, yeah, you jerked me, but I'm gonna be I'm gonna get that check one day. I went off, I started trying to rhyme. This is when I started taking rap seriously. By like breaking it wasn't serious to me, it was something to do. Because we would just go into clubs and do it to get girls. That's the only reason I rap, was to get girls. I didn't want to, because nobody had ever bought a car rapping. So what the fuck, I'm going to think I'm going to be a rapper? Rappers don't get paid, but you could go in there and get the attention and lie to the girls and fuck. <laughs> We're going to talk about that in a minute. So anyway, I make this record called Ron Pays on Sire Records. I was signed by Howie, um, not Seymour Stein. Seymour Stein, for those of y'all know, is the guy who signed Madonna. Now, he, this dude's crazy gay dude, right? So he's like, he wants to see me. Here's my record, he wants to see me. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go meet Seymour Stein. I don't know nothing about this cat. So me, I walk in with African Islam into his office in New York, and he said to me, he said, uh, I like your music, I, uh, he said, have you ever heard Calypso music? I'm like, nah. So he started playing me Calypso music, and then this fool starts jumping around in his socks in his office dancing, right? <laughs> now I'm from the hood, I ain't been around too many gay people that close, right? So I'm like, what's next? I'm like, checking. I'm like, I mean, this is how we get into business, man. I heard about this, man. <laughs> Looking at Islam, and then he comes with this. And I used to have, you have incredible eyes. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> But I'm still there. I'm like, this man's got the money. He's finna hook us up. So he says, I feel like you're like, he said, do you understand what the Calypso singers are singing about? I said, no. He said, they're singing about the problems in Trinidad. They're singing about the problems here, the problems there. This is their music. But just because you don't understand it does not make it invalid. It just means you don't understand or live their life. The same way I don't live your life. But I know it's valid. And I want you to make your album. You sound like Bob Dylan to me. He says, I can't act like I know what you're going through, but I know what you're saying is important to somebody. I'm like, wow, this dude is feeling it. And I really respected him because he was like able to say he didn't know, but he did know. He knew enough to say. And that's what a lot of people have to learn, that you got to know when you don't know and just leave it at that. It doesn't mean it's stupid. Like Quincy Jones told me, an accordion is a stupid instrument unless you play it that it becomes an, uh, an important instrument. So we're, as humans, we're quick to call stuff stupid we don't understand, that's, that's wrong. So I make my first album called Rhyme Pays, coming from a mentality of somebody that thought crime paid. I didn't expect to make any money, the album went gold, no video. I was like, shit. <laughs> my next album was called Power, because I found out about musical music's power. Power had the infamous album cover with me, Darlene, and Evil E. 
Evil had the gun and Darlene had on the bathing suit. At that point, all the feminist groups attacked. Oh, Ice T, she's not in the group. Uh, who is that? That was my girlfriend. I've never been married. I've never even been to a wedding. But at that point, I was married because, you know, I, I referred to her. That, well, that's my wife. You know, that's a street term, wifey. You know, Whoever is your main girl at the moment is your wife. I might need a wife tonight. Who gives a fuck? This is how we talk. <laughs> so I'm like, it's my wife. So they were like, oh, it's so terrible, it's so terrible. But the album cover, the intent was to show the powers that I felt controlled the world. One is the power of weapons, which we showed on the album cover. Two was the power of sex, which I think is the real power that runs everything. And this, the last is the power of deception. Like, because when you turn the album cover around, you know, we all had guns in the front cover. We haven't seen the power out. And the Bad Album cover wore an album of the year that year. And it was more than just a girl on the bathing suit, on the cover with a bathing suit. Um, we moved on from there to the iceberg, freedom of speech. Just watch what you say. The title of the album says it all. I learned at that point that we all have the right to say what we want, but you have to be prepared for the repercussions of what you say. Good example. Guy in the front row, what's your name? <clears throat> All right, Alice can stand up right now and say, Ice T, fuck you, you stupid son of a bitch, right? But you have to be prepared for my reaction to this. <laughs> Just because you have the right to say it doesn't mean people do not have the right to react. When I yelled cop killer, the police had the right to react to my statement, and they did. You have the freedom of speech, but just watch what you say because there will be repercussions to what you say. Don't think, well, I have the right to say it, so nothing should happen. No, 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 no. You have the right to say it in your head. But as soon as you let somebody else hear it, be prepared for what might happen. And that's a lesson I had to learn, you know? I mean, I, I've talked to a lot of powerful people. I remember I talked to Minister Farrakhan about it. He told me straight up, he said, I said, when you step into the middle of the street, be prepared, be prepared to get hit by a truck. You said it, they hit you. You know, if you don't want to say it that clearly, maybe you should slide your words in. But when you make a statement like that, be prepared. So that was freedom of speech, and we're going to discuss free speech, too, because I know a lot of you guys have this notion in your head that there is free speech. Forget about it. Forget about it. The Constitution is a nice concept. It sounds good, it's there just so something is there. But it fucking holds no water in it. This nice. I mean, listen, even if, I mean, just to break the Constitution down for a minute, when they wrote it, right, we all know that at that time it was okay to own black people, right? So the cats wrote it, name somebody who signed the Constitution. All right, fucking Jefferson sitting there. <laughs> and he looks over the Constitution. He's like, right there on. He's like, that's right, right. Okay, we can own the black people. Okay, it seems good to me. And he signed it. He was insane. How could you believe you could fucking own somebody? So due to the fact this thing was signed by lunatics, the whole fucking thing is void, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Now you can tell me, well that was then. If, if it was that much off then, how can it still be on now at all? Any of it. Think about it. If you read into the, um, the amendment as far as the right to bear arms, read into it. They say you have the right to bear arms because it is your last form of defense against tyranny. Tyranny is the day that the cops become the police. I mean the police become the enemy. It happened before. Paul Revere, it happened before. Okay? You have the right to protect yourself against government. So what the fuck you need a hunting rifle for? When the shit goes down, I need a fucking Mac-10. This is shit is real. <laughs> but they twisted it now saying, well, you can't hunt with this. It does not say you have the right to bear arms to hunt fucking ducks. <laughs> <laughs> Constitution, wipe your ass with it. This is nothing. <laughs> If it was real, then it would work. But it's not real because they amend it and twist it and fold it and mold it to whatever the fuck it's in at the moment. But it ain't, it's not valid, you know, because first of all, it was signed by lunatics, really. 
Okay. <laughs> we'll get more into your theories on free speech and I'll challenge them, definitely, because you ain't gonna say what you want. Even the stuff, if there's any reporters here tonight writing for any of the school newspaper, right now when I said I wanna fuck the girl in the ass right after, that just got edited because you're not gonna be able to write that in your school paper. You're gonna say, I said explet but you can't because you have no free speech. There has an editor who is gonna edit what you say. So don't look at people, you know, MTV is like, oh well, free speech. They censor everything that comes on that channel. You can't see you listen to the rap video, every word is bleeped out. Get a there is no free speech unless you go out in the middle of a field and you yell. <laughs> but as soon as you step with the ears of somebody, and you say something they don't like, they will move on you. All right? So from there we went into an album called OG, Original Gangster. I never really looked at myself like a gangster. I was more of a player. I never considered myself a gangster. The difference between a gangster and a hustler, a gangster takes you with use of force. A gangster walks into your club, a job, and says, you're going to pay me or I'm going to hurt you. I'm a gangster. You. A player has a little bit more finesse about himself. When we would rob people, at the end of the day, they'd be like, I can't believe those guys did it. They were so nice. <laughs> you sure you sure all the Rolexes are missing me? We play. We had more finesse about it. But when we made the music, they called it gangster rap. So at this point in my career, I said, well, if you're the original gangster, I mean, if it's gangster rap, we'll call it, you're the original. You were the first one to really put the guns and the drugs into the record. <coughs> During making an OG, I was in the studio, and when I would make my rap albums, I would always sit up and I would listen to other music. I've always been into other music. I started listening to rock and roll because when I came to Los Angeles, I lived with my aunt. My cousin would keep his radio tuned to the rock station, and he wouldn't let me touch his radio, or he fucked me up because he was bigger than me. <laughs> And he was listening to nothing but rock. So I didn't, I fought it for a minute. Then I started picking out the groups I liked. I, I, could, I started liking the more heavy stuff. And, the, you know, I might give away my age, but I was listening to everything from T Rex to, to Mata Hoople to Blue Oyster Cult, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, uh, Echo Winter. I knew, I, I know a lot about rock music just from listening to it and getting deep off into it. And, I, I always lead toward the darker stuff. In the middle of making OG album, I was listening to Slayer in the studio. And I got Angel of Death up on the speakers, and I'm writing lyrics. So my boys are standing behind me, and I'm like, bow to the kingdom of the dead. And I'm like, so they're like, yo, Ice Man, you know, man, we now behind me are Ernie C and all my other boys who play live instruments. They're saying, Ice Man, you know, man, we be. We can't get in a rock group, shit's fucked up. I'm like, y'all, man, you can, get, you can get in a rock group. No, man, I ain't trying to wear no tights or uh, <laughs> do my hair and all this shit, man. I was like, well, look, man, we got a guitar, bass player, man, we should just make a rock group, man. We can do something. And we made a group called Body Count. Now, Body Count was just my homeboys that played, and we just decided I would write the lyrics and we would just make a rock band. We would sing about the issues that we thought was happening. And we hit the stage with sweatshirts on, khakis, hats turned backwards, totally breaking the whole rap, rock persona at the time. And for those of you who forget those days, just look back at how Pantera used to look back in the day. They was looking pretty cute. Yeah, they are hardcore. It's funny, ain't how time changes people. But we came out buck wild. The first group to open for us was Rage Against the Machine. Also, groups like Korn and all that, there was a whole movement that was coming out of LA that was a little bit more hard than normal rock. It was kind of like gangbanger rock and roll. Suicidal was one of the first groups to really indulge in it. So, here we come. We make a record called Cop Killer and we play it all through the Lollapalooza tour with Jay's Addiction. Nothing happened. Everybody likes the record. The album comes out. The album was out a year. Rodney King got his ass kicked. We wrote the record for Rodney King got his ass kicked. Then, all of a sudden, an election year rolled up, and some cops in Texas decided, let's attack this record. They pulled it out of the fucking woodworks, 
and they made me become the enemy of the state. Ice-T is trying to make everybody kill the cops. The problem with cop killer wasn't that black kids hated the cops, it was the problem that I made the white kids yell cop killer. And this is a real issue, because they cannot allow any white kids in this audience to become my allies, because now you can really shift the status quo when you become in touch with what I got, what I'm angry with. We gotta not allow the enemy to be inside our own house. When mama sits up and says, look at those niggas in LA, they started that riot, and the, and the little girl says, mother, they're not niggas. And they did not start the riot because the cops have been messing over those people for years down there. And mom looks at her daughter and says, where you been, where you learning this shit? And she doesn't realize her daughter's been wearing a public enemy t-shirt for the past two years. <laughs> My next album was called Home Invasion, and that's what it was all about. The fact that rap invaded the suburbs and not only, not only told white kids about our lifestyle, but made them understand some of the issues that we were going through so we became more allies and friends about it. Uh, when they came after our records, they were not after the violence in our records. See, there is no fear of white kids learning nothing from no rap records that you can't learn from fucking napalm death or cannibal courts. I know what fucking white kids got to listen to. Kiss my ass. There's some shit out there that's way crazier than rap. Fuck what you're going through. I know, because I fucking in there. I fucking practice with Rob Zombie. I know I was in the fucking Ralphs the other day with Marilyn Manson buying fucking Cheetos. <laughs> Matt, all you Marilyn Manson fans, he's about to do a record with DMX. Trick off that. All right, so we off in there. I'm knowing what's fucks up. You know what the fear is? It's not the fear of you listening to the records and becoming some type, some way corrupted. It's the fear of you liking me. There's a fear in America of the white kids liking the black kids. The fear of you looking at me and saying, what's the matter with Snoop Dogg? Oh, fuck. Next year, want him at the country club. There is a fear. <laughs> there is a fear of the little white girl taking down her Danny Wahlberg poster and putting up fucking Jay Z over her little princess bedroom set. <laughs> you think I'm bullshit? This is what it's all about. Luke went to jail in Miami because he had 20,000 white girls screaming me so horny to a black man. It happened back in the days with rock and roll and they, they shot put rock and roll right out of the sky. Little Richard, all those people were singing it, Fast Dominoes, what they do, they bring in Elvis, they bring in Pat Boone, they remake all Little Richard's records, they say, We'll take rock and roll, black kids, you do R&B, and let's separate it. See, the nature of white children is not to fucking hate, it's to fucking join in. But the parents that have the power want to keep shit separate because they figure they fought for this and what they stole. So let's keep everybody separate. See, I don't believe that the essence of anybody is evil. I believe that we're forced apart economically because people don't want to share. See, now, you got these terms, they got out here, justice. But I want, how the fuck are you gonna ever have justice on stolen land? This shit ain't even the people that call it, they stole the shit. Every fucking thing. Next time when you're on your way home and you look at a mountain and somebody says, somebody owns it, I want you to tell me how the fuck does somebody own that mountain? How did they claim it? You know how they claim it? They put a fence around it, they got inside that with a gun, and they said, if you've come in here, I'm gonna kill you. That's how you fucking own shit. Take it. But inside of this country, we're gonna look for some form of justice from thieves. Get the fuck out of here. Shit's crazy. I'm here to let you know shit's crazy. I'm like, I'm, I'm off into some deep philosophy. I, I've got, received a whole lot of different philosophy letters from different colleges and stuff. And basically all the philosophers go crazy at the end of the day because once you figure this shit out, you realize you, you're gonna go crazy. Because this shit's nuts. But there's too much, un so what you'll choose to do is not ask for the explanations to these things I'm going to raise up tonight, but you're just going to say, yeah, well, fuck all that, you know. I mean, I always ask girls, and they be like, well, why do you do this? Why do you do this? I say, okay, why don't we do this? Why don't we look up at the moon? See the moon floating in the middle of the sky? The moon is floating. Ain't no strength. The shit is floating. Fuck what you're going through. It's floating. 
Gravity, uh, flow. Ain't, I, this ain't gonna flow. Flows. The Earth spins how many miles an hour around? How fast do we rotate? Who's a scientist? Who knows? It's spinning, creating negative G force. Because we're on the inside, it should shoot us out, but we're not. Right? So we got unexplained shit. You got a moon floating in the sky. You got us spinning 27,000 miles an hour, and we ain't shooting out. And you want to ask me why I came home late tonight. <laughs> There's too much unexplained shit to ask for explanations. And I think human beings want to know everything. We want to explain everything, because we're so fucking smart. But you can't even explain why my, how my hand's moving. You don't even know what this is. How is it doing that? You don't know. We don't. Well, the brain stem shoots down electrical uh, impulses. What the fuck? <laughs> so we go into that, too. So you got So I'm doing body count. Everybody, oh, ice tea's bad, ice tea's bad. We pull a record. We say, go and get a life, cops. Because, you know, we didn't do that record to start a revolution. It was just a record. I've seen movies called Cop Killers. I got t-shirts from groups called Millions of Dead Cops. Get off my dick. Move on with your life and let this blow up, right? Next thing you know, a guy walks up to me and says, you want to do a movie? I'm like, hey, you fucking crazy. I am not an actor. Now, Mario Bear people stepped to me in a club while I was talking to some girls, right? I had like four girls around me. I'm doing my iced tea thing, right? I'm charming. Oh, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it's incredible. Stand by her. You stand by her. So I'm doing my thing. And um, Mario steps up to me, says, Ice T, I want you to be in a movie. I'm in love, right, Mario? Yo, 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 this is Madeline. You know, you just want to meet the girls. So I'm thinking. Next day, they call me up. They say they want me to be in New Jack City. I'm like, yeah, New Jack City, what I gotta do? He said, well, we want you to play a cop. <laughs> right. <laughs> what else? We want you to wear dreadlocks. Come on, play, I got a perm, man. <laughs> Wearing the fucking dreadlocks. Think about it, Ice, this is a good role for you. So what I did was I called up my friends. So I called up my boy, I said, yo, man, check this out, man. They want me to be in a movie, man. They want me to play a cop. Word. <laughs> Could I be in the movie? <laughs> I'm asking you about this police issue, man. So I'm like, fuck. So I, I get calls from my boys that are in jail. I got like three or four of my friends right now that are doing life sentences. So they call me up occasionally to reach him. I'm like, yo, man, check this out, man. That's all good. We got the package in the mail. And, but check this out, man. It is all for me. Roll as a cop, man. I know you up in the bowels of the devil. And, what do you think about it, man? Me playing a cop. Word? <laughs> if I was out, could I be in the movie? <laughs> so I'm like, fuck. So I, I, whenever I get deep into stuff, I always ask women, because I think women have a different way of seeing things. I don't have no mother, so I talk to women. And, and when I talk to ladies, they said, Ice, you should go ahead and do the movie, because you're going to play the, the kind of cop that you know you should play and it'll give you a chance to move up to another platform. And that way, when you get to that platform, you'll still be able to speak about your issues, because most people, when they become actors, they stop talking about what's really going on in the hood. And you're going to tell motherfuckers what time it is in the fucking hood when you get there, nigga. And you better do that movie, Ice. If you don't do that movie, I see I'm whooping your ass. <laughs> I was like, all right, baby, we're going to do this. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do Jack City. I jumped. And y'all caught me. The movie was a success. I was like, damn. From since then, I've done 15 movies. I've been doing films. I have no idea how to act. I just, I just say the lines, right? I read the lines, and it'd be like, open the door, right? So I go, open the door. And the director goes, oh, incredible. I'm like, yeah. I mean, it could be like, sure left with the car, and then it's that. It's like, sure left with the car, and what we going to? Damn. Because it's funny, because other actors come in, 
Cheryl left with the car, man. <laughs> what are we gonna do? You know, they, the fuck is that? Nobody talks like that. <laughs> so I'm acting now, I'm making movies, I'm tripping, I'm making records, everything is, everything is cracking. I'm, 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 I'm going around talking to kids, I'm like in this, this weird world right now where, I don't know, you know, I, I did television, I did, I did, um, I did this, this thing on, played this guy on uh, New York Undercover, I was cutting people's fingers off. I got, I, I boosted the show three points, I went to Dick Wolf, I pitched my show players. We got canceled, but we did 22 episodes on there, and which is a full season on NBC, which is really hard, because my show is getting like 14 points, but NBC gets shows that does 30 points and 24 points, which are millions of people. If I had been on Fox, they got shows on Fox that got threes and twos and be on for a hundred shows. But you know, NBC is the big lead, but I learned a lot about that and I had a good time. But here I am, you know what I'm saying? Somebody who should be locked up in a holding tank. And I'm going through all this stuff and I'm still making records and you know, it's like, I'm trying to figure this out. So what happens is you get to this point and then they can't put negative hype on you anymore. They can't say you're a bad guy, you're a bad guy, because that don't work, because you told the country you're a bad guy. So the new way they try to take me out is say I'm a good guy, right? Uh, one Ice T sat in his house in the hills while the riots went on. Motherfucking riot. I, I bought a house. You crazy? Nobody lives in the ghetto by choice. The ghetto is not a, a black community, or a Hispanic community, or a Latino community, or age, it's a poor community. And you get the hell out of there when you can. Nobody says, oh, I just hit the lotto, I want to find me a nice spot in the ghetto. You're fucking crazy. <laughs> you get out. You get out because you owe it to yourself to live wherever you choose to live. When I lived in Los Angeles in South Central, I used to sleep in the back of cars because I was homeless for a while. I used to look up at the hills and say, man, I wonder what them people are eating, man. I'm hungry. I'm, a, I'm just knowing they're doing it like that. And that was like my goal. And I set that goal, and that's what I wanted to do. And I did it. So now, and you know, me, myself, me being Ice-T rapping, from the minute I came in the rap game, I was telling y'all I was going to get paid. And I did it. So I'm like, real. I did what I said I was going to do. I never rapped about I'm a state bro. When I came out, I said, motherfucker, I'm gonna have more money than you. And I accomplished that, so that makes me the fucking real shit. I pulled this shit off with my hat backwards, suck my ass. <laughs> you know? So I got me a house. So reporters come over to my house and they say, they walk in, they go, oh, it's very nice. Where did you learn how to decorate like this? I'd be like, yeah, I've broken enough of you motherfuckers' houses to know how to look like shit. <laughs> Why don't you just say it's really a nice house for a black person? Yeah. Why don't you say that? I'm walking John Bon Jovi's house. He got fucking lake in his living room. You don't walk in there and say it's a nice house. I might insult him. But they quit to tell me I got something nice. And you know, why not? Everybody wants something nice. That's why you guys are in school, because you want to have a nice lifestyle. And if you're smart, go out, get yourself some money, and raise the lifestyles of your friends and your families and anybody else that you can help, because ain't nothing nice about the ghetto. I love the people from the ghettos, but I, I despise the conditions. You know? I got a friend living in the hood. They cut his fucking light bill off when it, cause it was $58. $58, they cut his light bill off. My light bill can be $6,000, they won't cut it off. See what I'm saying? They don't even ask to see my meters. They ask me what my meters read, because they can't come where my meter is. The fuck, don't y'all want to live like everybody? Aren't you crazy? And people who say they don't want to live like that, any extra money you make, send it to my ass. Send it to me. I got some broke ass friends that can use it, because that's bullshit. I hate, I be with these rock motherfuckers. They be like, oh man, no, money doesn't matter. You full of shit. I was out on the road with Guns N' Roses and Metallica. They was checking stadium touring, $1.5 million a night. If I was making that, I could sit on, oh yo man, fuck the music, fuck the money. <laughs> I'm trying to get there. When you hear me say that, you know I'm there. When I go into that mode, hide from the IRS, I still am.
<laughs> so what I'm, what I'm really trying to say is, when you come from the bottom, never apologize for any of your successes, man, because you work for it. You busted your ass for it. You're in school right now while other people are laying on their ass. You working. Get your shit and be proud of what you did. Help your family. And, you know, as quick, they like, well, what are you doing for your community? I don't know. I got 200 friends, right? Broke. So my community comes out. I, I got 200 friends I know personally broke. So I'm there. Let me get them off the streets. Them is the kind of cats you don't want to meet anyway. Let me help them. That's a charity in itself. You don't know, you take 10 guys, give them $500 a month, that's a lot of money. Give them 10, 20 is a lot of money. And they can't work. I got a month on everybody, people walk up to me. Yo, Ice man, give me a job. Like, what can you do? I, I'm a bodyguard. How you gonna bodyguard me? I can whoop your ass. <laughs> I don't need no tough guys. There's enough tough guys. Matter of fact, there's a factory that, that makes tough guys. It's called a penitentiary. They have no problem. We need, I need somebody smart. I need educated people around me. I, I got enough, you know, tough cats. So, let's get, let's, some of the stuff I've been accused of. One is I glamorize violence. The, my people that hate me, if any of you are in here, I tell you, well, you glamorize violence. I don't glamorize violence. Violence is what it is. I don't know how you can glamorize violence or crime it is glamorous until you get caught. Any of you who've ever watched television and seen money stacked to here with a DEA raid somebody and didn't say, if I could just get one of those bundles, shit, just one of them, and I can pay this. You've been in, bit by the, the drug of crime, and once you're successful at it, there's nothing more intoxicating. We used to all watch, well, I used to watch Miami Vice, we watched all those different shows. Why? Because you like to see the drug dealer's house and the cars and the, the spoils of it. The problem with it is you go to jail or you end up dead. Now, I've been shot at, blocked in, trapped in situations. Guns came out, shoot out, brass flying all over the place. This ain't no fun scene. You know what I'm saying? And when I tell you that if somebody got shot in the head, their head exploded, that's what really happened. I'm not glamorizing it, I'm telling you how it is. Uh, I just tell the truth. I think the problem is a lot of people won't tell kids the truth. They talk to their kids, they say, well, if you sell drugs, you're gonna go to jail or end up dead. That's not true, you might end up rich, but the odds are against it. That's the truth. Because there's a lot of rich drug dealers out there right now that are getting, there's a lot of rich, like, I mean, one of the biggest, richest drug dealers right now just bought MCA, Seagram's, you know? Who are they? Bootleggers from the 30s that came up. Drugs, liquor, same thing. And they just bought MCA, which is universal, which just bought my company, Polygon, and bought Motown. Tell me you can't get over selling drugs, you just can't get caught. You know? Shit's fucked up out here now. What drugs do to people and all that? You're looking for a thin line, and then again, you're looking at law and what's right and wrong, and that's all a matter of perspective. So when I talk to kids, I say right now, the odds are you will end up in the penitentiary or you will end up dead. I'm not gonna say sell a drug. I cannot tell you any great stories about successful drug dealers. I advise you to take a safer road like I did. I have nothing good to say, but I'm not gonna tell you it can't be done, because it is being done as we speak tobacco companies. Same thing. They just, you know, legalized themselves. They figured their way to transform their hustle into something legal. You have to, the biggest pimp to ever walk the fucking earth. Goddamn. He just figured a way. I won't sell pictures. I won't sell pussy. I'll sell pictures of pussy. And get paid. Respected at this point. Mr. Hefner, a friend of mine. <laughs> pimp on me. When I met you, Hefner, you have to say, well, Ice-T, you're no stranger to controversy. You're welcome in my home. <laughs> and believe it or not, the first time I met him, he had on the bathrobe, the whole shit. This motherfucker is real. He's real. You Hefner, man, my player buddy. So I don't think I glamorize violence. I think that normally we have a bloodlust in us as human beings. 
because really, honestly, the mistake we make as human beings is we believe we are such so far up the line above animals, but I truly believe that we are the most vicious, bloodthirsty animal ever to walk the face of this earth. Now, the minute you think that you're above it, come on, let's break it down. We're the only thing that sharks are afraid of. Don't laugh. We're the only thing that kills for sport, right? We're the only thing that kills our friends, right? We're the only thing, I think we might be the only thing that gets jealous in the world too, because animals kind of just throw it around a little bit. We got a lot of problems. Let's think, let's just check, let me show you what a, what a human being is. Imagine we all came from another planet and we were be, built different than we are. We're built on transistors. All of us are electrical mechanisms that, now we, we come to Earth and we look at humans. What is a human? It's some thing that walks around and sticks things into its head all day. This is what you do all day. You stick shit into your head. It comes out your ass. And you stick things into your head. Okay? That's what we do. Now, what we stick into our head is shit from out of the dirt. Vegetarians, oh, I only, it came out of the dirt. <laughs> Dirt's clean. We eat live animals. We eat, we kill shit, need it. You know what the chickens think? Oh, yo, uh, who are these motherfuckers? <laughs> you know, what are these things? Shit. Cow see you walking like cold. Oh, there they go. Those are the monsters. We're mon we're, the, we're the coldest shit, but we're we're the, we're civilized, right? Let, it, let us tell it. We're above. We've just become top of the food chain, and what becomes the top of the food chain in the jungle is the most the the one that kills the best. That's why we're here, and eventually we're gonna kill our each other, cause that's what we do. Now, we want to bypass our nature. Our nature, monogamy is not our nature. That's something somebody wrote or something that somebody felt, but that's not natural. We're going to get deep into that. <laughs> because the next thing is, I'm sexist. Now, I ain't sexist, but I'm for the male team. <laughs> there's a male team, I believe there's a female team. Men gotta stay down with the men, women are gonna stay down with the women. Point blank, I'm sexual. I'm gonna tell you how men are about sex, point blank. Women have got it so confused and they get mad at me because I tell you how men are. Men wanna fuck all the time. Right now, dudes, Wanna fuck? When they walk up to you on campus, say, "Here, yeah, what do you study? What's your major?" He's really saying to himself, "He's got a nice ass. I wanna fuck that." Platonic friends to men are just women that we couldn't fuck. But we would if we could. But you won't let us so we become platonic. And usually we don't hang around you that fucking much. <laughs> Laugh if you want. But a male's dick, the dick situation is what controls the world. If men didn't want to fuck, there would be, the economy would crash in one day. None of us would go to work. None of us would wake up in the morning. None of us would do shit. We just lay around, get fat, fart. We wouldn't do shit. Why would we go to school so we can come, become intelligent, get money, and fuck? <laughs> the best pussy they get. 
They will. Men will stay close to the best pussy. Now, when a man meets a woman, they, you go through four stages. You go through physical attraction, mental attraction, mental compatibility, then physical compatibility. Physical attraction means when you meet somebody, you say, could I imagine myself being intimate with this person ever? If you meet a guy or a guy meets a girl, you look at her and say, could I imagine kissing this girl? Could I imagine being close? If you can't imagine it, it doesn't happen. Conversation ends right then. The flirting ends. We know when you're flirting. Now, if you can imagine it, you go into mental attraction. You talk. If the first thing comes out of a male's mouth is some asshole shit, you say he was cute, but he was in jerk. Vice versa. She was fine, but she was some supreme bitch. Now, if you're attracted, you go into compatibility. Can I get along with this person over a period of time? If you can, you go into physical compatibility. You kiss, you either hit or you miss. Like, oh, has he ever been with a girl before he hugged me? Oh, shit. Oh, God, or God damn. <sighs> Puckered my ass. You know, if your butt, if your butt snatches in, usually that's a win. When you see a car you like and your butt goes, oh, that's the way I know. The pucker factor. Put that into your repertoire. If a girl touches you and your ass don't pucker right, she ain't gonna do it for you. But when they, ooh, that shit happens, you know it's something. Now, I deal with sex just like this. I'm telling you, mother, men want to get down. Women, they got different ways about going about it. Men are more blatant and front, up front. Women are a little bit more cunning and different. I break it down like this. Men are dogs, women are cats. Men, we fuck, you gotta get the water hose and get us a loose, we're in the middle of the street. But fellas, this is for your girlfriend. You ain't never seen a cat fuck, but kittens always come, don't they? Watch your girl. These fucking hoes is off some other shit. You say, I'm not a hoe. Well, what the fuck ever you want to call yourself. Because you're quick to call us hoes, and you're quick to call us dogs. Oh, they're a dog. They're dogs. So what's the problem, bitch? We talking shit to each other, let's talk. I'm not gonna call, you know, Mother Teresa no bitch, unless she acts like one. But she didn't to me, I like the lady. More than princess, whatever. I wasn't feeling her that much. It's easy to be rich and go around and act, you know, benevolent and become that, but it's hard when you're broke to do it. Now, back to sex though, something that had everybody going here. I go on my tangents. Now, the male dick factor. Now, a lot of guys may not be into it, but let's say, for instance, if you're gay, you want to make your other partner happy. Believe me, there's always one person in the relationship that wants to fuck. That's what holds it together. Got to have it. But then why are we here? What's the end? What, what is the holy grail? All we do as human beings on this earth is interact with each other. What are you going to do? You going to make a spaceship? You guys going to change the economy or save this or save that? What are you going to do with your career? All you're going to do in life that means anything is interact with human beings. That's all you do. And for some reason, we connect and we recreate more little ones. Maybe that's what we're supposed to do here, is draw toward each other. If sex was the most terrible thing, say you had to cut your wrist off to have, to have a child, we could be extinct at this point. But whatever put us here made it the most euphoric thing when you connect to the right person. You don't need drugs, you don't need anything. It's, it's, it's like some other shit. Sex is a great thing, it's what we got here to do. There's really nothing else to do. There's a lot of frustrated people because they're not getting it. They got issues that's far beyond this lecture. But women are in denial. And this is where the problem sets in. Men, not nah, nah, ice, it's just ice. It's just ice. Watch this. Fellas, if anybody in here feels that I'm lying, put your hand up. I rest my fucking case. 100%. You, you think you're lying? That's because you're sitting next to your girl and she just threw an elbow in your fucking ribs. <laughs> That's what's going on with Clinton right now. Everybody in the White House, everybody in Washington knows why he did it. 
Cause ain't a man on earth gonna turn down head in the fucking Oval Office. <laughs> but all those politicians in DC's wives are like, how do you feel about Clinton? Oh no, he's impeaching. Oh, <laughs> they're scared of their wife. Cause you can't agree with him. You have to be politically correct. No, he did the wrong thing. They know, men, we know in our heart, Clinton. I mean, maybe he could have picked a better babe, I mean. <laughs> but he did what you do. He went after her, he, pers he was shooting at her, she went down, pulled his dick out. It was a cigar, that's some other shit. It's like, he's fucking, but you know what, I mean, I give Clinton some, I give Clinton props on my level because I'm like, all the fellas out there that know, you gotta have a lot of courage to have sex behind your girl's back, your wife's back, right? Even if you have it in your own house, you know, like, oh, let me go in and just make it. Bam, this is where my girl sleeps. I mean, that's some sacrilegious shit. You could get killed, you know? But to do it in the Oval Office, man, imagine what size nuts, man. <laughs> Clinton is the motherfucking man. <laughs> Fuck what you're going through. I want that man with me if we gotta go to war, man. He got nuts, man. <laughs> Al Gore, I don't see why he's not fucking around. What's it, Timber? Ooh, shit, I know he ain't had pussy in years. That <laughs> don't you know funny how Timber Gore, when she got into the presidency, you <laughs> never heard one more word out of her? Don't you remember how she used to run her mouth? Because somebody in that White House said, Gag this bitch. If she talks, we're not gonna win the election. And she needs to shut up with all that PMRC shit. They're not trying to hear it. We need the MTV vote. Tipper, shut up. She ain't, she, she shut up too. You don't even know she's there. That's some shit powerful. Maybe, you know, in the White House, they'll check your woman for you. <laughs> I think like this, it's war. The female, you got your issues and agendas in a relationship. Men, we got our issues and agendas in a relationship. And let the games begin. Sexist, I don't know. For me to be sexist, I would say women are less than men. Women shouldn't get the same this, that, that, nah, nah, nah. I'm not like that. You know, I'm not like that. But as far as me being down with the men, I'm down with the men. That's how I am. And you all down with the women. You're, you're, I'm a maleist. You're a feminist. I'm a maleist. Well, that's the problem. You know? Crazy, man. Women, see, the thing of it is, is this is what you gotta understand. Women's nature is to covet. The male's nature is to conquer. This is basically our nature. Now, we both have a female and a male side. I'll give you a good example. Female's nature, covet. Girl walks into a club and another girl has the same dress on. One of y'all wanna go home. That's my dress. That's my man. This is my child. This is my home. Me and another guy walk in, we got on the same shirt, we be like, where you get yours at? We don't care, because we do not covet. We conquer. That's why a man can have sex with you and leave you and pass you off to his boy, because once he's conquered you, he can cast you off. This is what our nature is. My man right there saying, Ice, man, you're giving them the game. Look at him. <laughs> But we will not cast off anything that is valuable. So if it happens to you, it just means you ain't valuable to him. Doesn't mean you're invaluable. These men conquer. Now in the 90s, women became more masculine and started doing male traits. Women will go out one night stand, you would not call you up. We can't deal with it. <laughs> you're like, man, I rock that shit, man. Just call me. She ain't called back. <laughs> yeah, nigga, you was whack. Your shit was nothing, I'm through. <laughs> but really, from my studies, it's not in the female's nature. At the end of the day, if a woman has had a lot of sexual partners, I don't really believe, maybe I'm wrong, but the majority of women don't feel good about themselves. It's not the nature of the female. Whereas a man could lay on his deathbed, have 500 kids and thousands of women, and be giving high fives all around the bed to all his boys. You did it, man. You remember that big head? Yeah. This is just some shit that's going on. But think about it, when a man covets, what do you girls say? Baby, don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me, please don't leave me, don't leave me, oh baby, I'll die, I'll die. What do you say? You sound like a bitch, right?
Because you don't want us to do that. Yo, I'm sorry. Did it. Do what you got to do. Now, y'all hate that. But that's man shit. So get over it. Again, it's a sexual war around here. We're at each other's throats, you know? We trying to do our thing. You trying to do your thing. You looking for peace, but there's a moon floating in the sky. We don't know how that's happening. So don't try to find too many solutions. Just understand the animals are interacting and it gets crazy and you girls want to have a man and hold him down and he's going to be yours and that's some very, that's some wrong, uh, uh, you're mine. mine. How, what are you doing? You're telling what? That's why men ain't trying to get married. Ain't too many men really don't get married. Men ain't trying to get married. You trap us into that shit. Men ain't trying to get married. Niggas was like, ah, oh, man, shit, fuck that. <laughs> they just, you hear guys talking about getting married, they be like, yeah, man, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I'm letting you know. Now, a lot of people are gonna go into denial. And a lot of you guys got your females convinced that it ain't like that. But I came all the way up here to Washington to tell you, females, men are not naturally monogamous. We fight to do it, we try to do it, and Good luck, my man, good luck, but it's not gonna be easy. And some of the guys that remain more monogamous are guys that can't get as much pussy, they have like a problem getting it. <laughs> they, that guy that, that maybe you're the first shit, cause some guys only fuck like once a year. <laughs> now, if you've got a guy like that, he might hold on to you, but you get a fly. See, problem is we all want fly shit. So the guy wants the more attractive woman, but she's got more opportunities to leave because there's more people approaching her. When you got a fly guy, more opportunities open up to him, and this is how it happens. And it's just rough. But, you know, me, I'm monogamous. I don't fuck around ever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's part of the game, too. Teach you a little later. All the fellas want a secondary class in this. Now, <laughs> last they say I'm racist. I don't know how the fuck I'm racist, but they claim Ice T. Yeah, he's racist. You know, they throw everything they can at you. I got a quick racism test for you. Would you have a problem with somebody from another race? Like, say, if you're white, maybe you say a Jamaican guy. If you're black, say a, a Jewish guy, white, whatever. Oh, by the way, Jewish people are black. All you guys got to get over that, too. Jewish people, my brothers. Y'all black. You ain't white, so. <laughs> They'll hang your ass right with me, baby. You better pick a side. Roll. I've been to Tel Aviv. I've been over there, right? You know, Africa. That's why I'm trying to play it off. Let your hair kink up like it's supposed to. Go ahead. <laughs> Would you have a problem with somebody from another race having a child with your sister, brother, mother, girlfriend, if your girl left you and she picked another race? Would that bother you? If the answer is yes, you're racist. The only way to explain to know true racism is you have to use the sex card. Sex card really breaks stuff down. I was on a, I was on a plane with this lady, white lady in a, in a um, on the way, and I was riding first class, and she says to me, she said, why aren't there more black people in first class? <laughs> uh, all right, okay, I got one here, let's talk. I don't know, maybe they like riding, you know, they like being close to each other. How are you doing? <laughs> so me and her went into this conversation, we had four hours to talk, and I talked to her about everything, and she profoundly said she was not racist. I am not racist, I have a black girlfriend, I grew up, and da, 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 da. So I said, well look, you know, we got a show tonight, and what's happening? She said, I have a daughter, her daughter is 19. I said, is that right? <laughs> she let your daughter come to one of my, come to the show tonight, like that, you know, I, she could come, she could be my guest, and this, that, and the other, and well, I don't know, you know, I don't know, you know. I mean, what kind of crowd do you have? <laughs> a lot of black, you know, niggas. <laughs> but our brothers, the brothers, I know. She's like, well, no, I don't know. I said, why, would you have a problem with me dating your daughter? Well, there's a lot of nice white guys. 
See? She didn't even know she was racist, and a lot of you people don't know, but you would have a problem if your mother came home with a different race boyfriend. There's an issue. I really don't have any problem with that. My thing is not, not about that. I, I judge the devil by his deeds. You know, I don't, just because we have the same skin pigmentation does not make you my brother or my sister. You have to treat me like a brother or a sister before I will be down with you like that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, uh, in one of my raps, I said, I, I, I don't hate white people, you know? And that's a well-known fact, because all my homies got killed by blacks. You know, I ain't got no time to be mad at nobody else. I got to deal with issues in my own neighborhood, and I have no problems with that. There's a lot of people that got problems with interracial marriages and stuff like that, but I think that if we all got together, we would be able to hate. Like, my, I have a little boy named Ice, and his mother's Mexican. So he's black, Mexican, black, Mexican, call him what you want. But how could I ever sit up and listen to somebody talk bad about Latinos when my son is Latino? See what I'm saying? You cross it up. You know, me, my nationality is my mother is black, my father was black, but we, my, my, my heritage would be from New Orleans, Creole, which is French and black. So it's white people somewhere in my bloodstream. And I think if everybody's got along together and just fell in love with who they feel at the moment, there would be a lot less pain in this world. But as long as you divide the teams up, see, race again is a team. You guys are on teams. This school is better than the other school in this state. And y'all rock around each other. Races do the same thing. We, we side up, say we're better than them because we all look the same. To me, that's, that's, that's even crazier. Now, females are like, well, sexism and racism is the same thing. No, it's not. No, it's not. Racism has no bounds. Racism is based around just the color and, 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 a, and, a, and a, a geographically where you came from. Sex is some shit. Sex is like, I want to fuck you. You got a pussy, I got a dick. This is an issue that's gonna be here. Once we answer all the religious problems and everything, there'll still be dicks and pussies walking around here and somebody gotta get fucked. <laughs> this ain't gonna never change. If it does change, we're in trouble because then we will become extinct. <laughs> gotta go after each other. But the racial thing, I don't see myself being as that. I realize that a lot of white kids may have been taught a little different but I don't necessarily look at you as an enemy or anything. And I think in the whole, what I'm, what I'm really getting at is that I'm not really here trying to defend myself, but just kind of like let you see that everything we deal with in the world is based on a perspective. It has to deal with the way you see it. And if you, you know, if, if, you, if you have 300 million or 500 million dollars, then that Rolls Royce Azure that costs 300,000 is, cheap car, you bought a dozen of them. But if you're broke, it's a waste of, I can't see how you can see, spend that kind of money. It all has to do with perspectives, and the bottom line is none of us in this room come from the exact same reality. So do not expect to totally understand your friend or give them advice, because you're not really living their life. And their life is made up of stuff that happened to them as, as children and other things. A lot of people have been indoctrinated with religion, Religion is basically a driven in human theory. Because God ain't wrote one word in one book, none of the books. But every man who wrote, whether it was the Quran, whether it was the Bible, the Torah, whatever, said at that moment they were divinely intervened and God spoke to them and they wrote these words down on the paper. Well, if that's the case, who is to tell you God is not talking through me right now? to tell you that it's all bullshit. Because who is gonna, who knows? There's like how many, 10, 20,000 practice religions? So when you go to heaven or hell or when you die and that hot and Christian motherfucker sitting there looking at you, say, remember me in that airport? <laughs> You're fucked. <laughs> but what we're gonna do while we're on this earth is we're gonna fight and we're gonna go to war over who knows or who has the best understanding of what, of the unknown? Who has the best understanding of the unknown? Think about it for a minute. Because I've been to China. 
I see Shaolin monks, right? They don't, they don't know what they're talking about, right? <coughs> I've been to New Zealand and Australia and seen the Aboriginal people practice dream time. They stupid, right? Muslim, 100 sects. Not sex, sect. Everything I said. Oh, he said 100 sects. So Muslim, no sect. <laughs> Each one thinks the other one don't know what they're talking about. You know, one of the ways the United States was able to rip off this country was say that the Native Americans didn't believe in Christianity and they were wrong and they were savages, so we can kill them. I'm not here to shoot down your religious beliefs, but I just want to know who the hell do you believe? And what are you believing? You're believing something that somebody taught somebody that some human being wrote. All right? I know there's some energy going on here. I know there's some type of life force. I'm not total atheist. I don't do not believe, uh, I don't disbelieve in God, but God as a human being or a person, I don't know what that is. I think there's some ill energy forces running around here. Heaven and hell, I believe those are emotional states. But you talk religion around people. I was in the Vatican, right? I spoke in, in Italy, in Rome, around all kinds of bishops and cardinals, and they came to see Ice-T, right? And when I said that statement, and I challenged the Roman Catholic Church to prove that I did not know what I was talking about, none of them couldn't say shit. Because they believe God speak through a, spoke through a human being. I mean, what makes the Pope outbreak anybody? Tell me who the fuck the Pope is. What the fuck? Why do you ride around a bulletproof van? If he's so connected, what does he need a bulletproof van for? <laughs> He's hooked up. <laughs> That's why all these so-called peaceful people, why they got all the security? Clinton come here, I walk on here, I'm the gangster, I'm the bad guy. I came by myself. Nobody would walk in. If Clinton came, everybody, he's a good guy, right? The bad, shit's twisted. Now, I don't want you walking out of here telling me, talking about iced tea, uh, was dissing religion, because each one of you guys will diss the other one's religion if I let you go. So I'm not dissing anybody's. I'm just saying, why don't you challenge and just read for yourself and look into yourself. All philosophers basically say is take the, the initiative to think and come up with your own solutions because every one of you is a miracle. Every person in this room is a miracle. When you have a baby, how the f where did that come from? Right? And like I said, just hold your hand in front of yourself and watch it move. Now, how, are, how is your child less connected to God than your minister? Ministers are straight pimps. What the minister does, I was a pimp. What a minister does is he makes you pay to get hooked up with God. He pimps God. He says, pay me, and I can hook you up. I know him better. I can get you the pussy. <laughs> so pay me, and I can hook you up. That's some bullshit. Send money to me, and I can hook you up. I, know, I read the book better than you, and I can help. You don't need that, man. Reach inside your heart right here. There's an energy force, and it tells you when things are right and things are wrong. And you can, you know, if you want to, if I, I, I'm a theologist. I studied all these religions. I know what's up. If you get up into it, yin yang, reap what you sow, energy fields. There you go. That's enough you need to know. Do the right thing, good things will happen to you. But maybe, see, I was talking to this Indian girl, and she says, well, Ice, if you do good things, good things won't happen to you because most of the people in the world are evil. I mean, are, are rich. All the evil people are rich. I said, well, maybe good things, it's not money. Maybe in your, in your head, by being positive, you'll receive positive energy only inside your head. It's not like if you do something good for me, something magically is going to happen to you, but you'll feel better about yourself, and it'll create an aura of better energy inside yourself. Maybe that could be the answer. Who knows? But when I die, Believe me, you know, if, if, if anybody is going to start a religion, it should be somebody who came the fuck back <laughs> from the other side, because it's all based on the other side. So until somebody comes back, I ain't trying to hear it. Me, you know, and, you know, 
Yo, he's crazy, man. I'm not crazy. I'm just word. I'm just willing to think and use my mind and not just accept information that's taught to me. Because you know, bottom line is religion is the coldest game and the coldest racket that ever came out. It's a racket to me. It's a game that says, I'm going to teach you right now. And if any of you think or challenge it, you're going to hell. If you even think it in your mind that what I'm saying is wrong, you're going to hell. It has the coldest catch-22 ever written in any scam ever put on this earth. Challenge me. What I'm doing right now is blasphemous, right? I'm still here. I've been doing this shit for 20 years. And if I go to hell, I'll be so busy shaking hands with all my homies, I ain't going to have no time to be bullshit. <laughs> Fuck it. Challenge. Challenge and think for yourself. It'll scare the shit out of people. As soon as you start thinking for yourself, you will scare your mother. You will scare them. Oh, Lord. They've gone crazy. They've been listening to the heist. <laughs> all, all I'm trying to say is that what I'm trying to do tonight, before we get into the answer questions and stuff, because I, I want to let you guys talk about like, whatever you want to talk to me about, is that all I try to do is show courage. And courage isn't just being the guy that's tough that'll fight you. It's the guy that's going to challenge everything and use his own brain. I know there's a lot of good brains in here, but your, your mind is kind of blocked off when you read this book and accept that as what it is. You have to read it, take it, run it through your life, shoot it back out. Tell me what you think. Build with me, you know? So what I want to do now, since I've taken you through a lot of shit, I want to talk, and we're going to get into some other things about what's important to you. Now, dealing with me, we can talk about anything. We can talk about gangs. We can talk about teenage pregnancy. We can talk about rap. You can ask me Ice Cube's phone number. You can get off into music. <laughs> Uh, controversy, whatever you think you might be interested in as far as what you're trying to do, ask me the question and I'm going to bring it back to you. So this way this, this, this conversation will go off into its own tangents and we can get off into it. But right now, as you're looking at me, you're like, okay, this is guy has his own opinions. And that's my name on my book. My book is called The Ice Opinion. Who gives a fuck? And really, you shouldn't give a fuck about what I'm saying. I'm just saying it, but it takes courage to say it. And a lot of you guys might be watching me saying, man, I want to I wanna be able to speak on shit. I want to say what I believe. If what I say is something you don't believe, explain it to me. All right? So let's, we got some mics. Could they move the mics out a little bit? So, and let's get some people to step up and ask me some questions. And let's go into the, the next uh, evolution of this. Shit. Now, don't be mad when they ask, but they can ask me anything. Shit. Like, you know, so we can, cause what's important to them is important to them. Hey, why, homie, why don't you pull the mic back a little bit from the stage? Yes, yeah, so right there, that's cool. And pull that one back, right, okay. I think first, thanks, I see you about PPS. It's good to have somebody else like you out here to talk to, you know, the minorities, and plus that, um, other races, or the, I'm sorry, not other races, well, other races see. Other races, other yeah. teams, you're all here. Yeah, let, you, let them know that we do have somebody positive like yourself out here. And uh, my question is, how, how, do you, how would you explain the stereotype that in rap, you have your white uh, rappers acting black, and your black rappers so-called so acting white? How, how would you explain that? Well, you know, it's like, I know, like, the way you act has a lot of got to do with where you come from and where you're around. It's like it's, it's like the people that you're around will kind of mold your personality. Like if I went to a predominantly white area, either I would start acting like them, or I would turn them all, and they would start acting like me. The more powerful person will transform the rest. I mean, right now, if you go to Los Angeles, you got Latino gang. But in the Latino gangs, you got Asian kids that talk like essays. You know, the white kids that talk like black kids because they grew up. So a lot of that stuff is real. You know, you got white girls that talk like sisters, talk harder than sisters, but they be up around sisters and they pick it up and now you're dealing with their skin pigmentation. The way we act comes from where we, how we came up. What bothers you is people faking it when People are trying to be something that they're not. 
the biggest, the key to the game really is just be who you are. Uh, a lot of us, you know, I'll give you one term in the, in the hip hop business is keep it real. Keep it real, keep it real. Yo, Ice, keep it real. But keep it real to me means keep it real to yourself. What is real to you guys? Is it going to school? Is it getting your education? Is it getting the straight A's? Now, is your buddy trying to get out and get high? That ain't keeping it real to you. So when he does that, you do this, and you're keeping it real. The kid that's got all the tattoos on his body, but he really didn't want to do it. He did it because his boy did it. He's not keeping it real. To keep it real, you got to do what you want to do. You follow what I'm saying? Now, when I never got high, I never drank, I still don't. When I was little, high school, kids like, yo, hit the joint. I don't want to hit the joint. Well, if you don't hit the joint, you's a bitch. Well, if I'm a bitch, why don't you make me hit the joint? See, I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to keep it real to me, not what you think. So a lot of these white kids, they might fantasize the black culture. They may like it, and they like want to be down with it and stuff like that, and that's cool. A lot of black kids feel like if life was better for them if they was white, and they reach for that lifestyle and they're not from it, they didn't grow up in it. That's a, that's a personal issue, you know what I'm saying? But you're gonna be figured out soon enough and you're gonna have to go home to where you're from, you know? But I, I don't have any problems with it. I think you can see it, you know what I'm saying? But I don't like the term, well, you're trying to act white, you know? I mean, just me, the way I talk, you know, oh, he's, he's trying, fuck what you going through. I'm talking the way I talk, suck my ass. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So, you know, if I walk up to a white boy and he's like trying to be black and I say, yo, man, you acting black, he gonna be like, yeah, fuck you. I'm saying this is where I'm from, this is how it gets down. I'm like, okay, all right, play all right, I know, you know. Some people are really from there, you know, but you're gonna be from wherever you are. And a lot of kids right now, since you're going to college, might say you might talk slightly white. You know, no, I'm just saying, so maybe your friend or somebody, you know, because you don't say every other word, you know what I'm saying? Sham, keep it real, sham, be more word like God, your word about knowledge born, you know. Fuck them. You know, come get the fuck out of your face and all the black, white rappers that want to be black, that's not the way to be successful. Let's just be who you are. One last thing. I, I hang out with like a gang of gang bangers and stuff, and some of my real close friends are like the cats from Black Flies sunglasses. Like some ill, like Manhattan beat surfer kids, right? They always meet up in my house. So the surf guys come in and the Crips are standing there. Surf like, yo, fucking, yo, this fucking rad man. Khaki's fucking rad man. Fucking rule, dude. Fucking Crips rule, dude. And the Crips is like, yo, cuz, cuz is bugging, cuz. You got the, yo, that shit's hell, cuz. But they get along. Why? Because neither of them transfer. Now, if the white kid comes in and tries to be a gangbanger, the black kid, I have a problem with that. But we'll respect you, you respect it for being who you are. And some people will learn that sooner or later. All right? Question. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, when's your next rap show up here? And also, what's your take on affirmative action, which was voted down in California, and it was voted down in Washington? I want to know what your take is on that. As far as another rap show up here, I probably won't be performing until I put out another album. I got a new album that I'm working on right now, my seventh rap album called Seventh Deadly Sin which is definitely some crazy shit because I really feel that the seventh sin was people from the ghettos or minorities, or just people from the bottom as a whole talking into the airwaves. The whole theory of what we're doing right now, this is something that was never meant to happen. So my album is very crazy and seditious and wild. And it's another Ice-T album. It'll probably be on the news. You don't have to worry about when it comes out. But, <laughs> As far as affirmative action and, and the different things that they're dealing with, as far as letting people into the schools, and that's what you're talking about? Yeah. What? You know, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous because I think it's like backwards. The people that don't have the money are the people that need to get into schools the most. You know? It's kind of like, what's up? I mean, people used to ask me, they say, well, I just want you to get into politics. I'm kind of thinking about it now, Jesse Body Ventura got on there, you know. <laughs> but then I also would tell people, well, I told you I got out of crime. So. <laughs> but one of the things I always said that is what I would do if I had any political power, I think schools should just be free. Period. If 
for everybody. And as long as you, as long as you show interest in learning, you should be able, and I'm talking about on full scale, huh? not, not, not junior colleges, real colleges. I think there's enough money in the system to pay for us to send our kids all the way through college and get PhDs if that's what they desire without the scholarship gain and all that. Just if you want to go and you keep a basic grade point average, I mean a C average, just as long as you show you want to learn something and you're not bullshitting, you should be able to go to school and have a chance. You know, but it's not like that. And they'll shut it down and they'll, they'll twist it. But it's ass backwards that rich people have a chance to go to school where the poor people don't have any affirmative action or any action in getting up an angle on it. And there's enough, there's enough money out there, man. They got, they, they got fucking Charles Glenn floating around out there for what? For what? You know, we got issues right here on Earth that are more important to me. I mean, this one less spaceship. I'm not against the space program. I'm ready to go to outer space. Fuck that. But I'm like saying that we could use one less mission out there and one less stealth bomber, some other shit, and open some more schools, man. Shut down some of these penitentiaries, which are going up like daisies all over the country by privately owned companies. Because they get paid when the guys are incarcerated. That's big business, you know what I'm saying? Almost now, $100,000 a year to incarcerate each inmate. And I know that's way more than going to this school for four years, right? So it's like, it's twisted out here, you know? And it, you don't see kids going here to universities trying to become doctors and lawyers robbing 7 Elevens. It doesn't happen. You do that when you lose hope and you don't think you have another option. What's up? Yeah, how you doing now? I'm a diehard Ice-T fan since day one. I've been keeping up with the music. I was going to ask about your album, but you already told me that. Also, I was going to ask, um, what kind of schedules do you have with your lectures? Like, um, how long? What I do is I have like a lecture agent who kind of like what I do is when I have free time, they kind of like throw my name out there. They say like, well, Ice is available for these two weeks. Like right now, I'll do four of them. And then I'm gonna go back to, to Los Angeles and I go to Bratislava to do some films, like Yugoslavia. Then I'll come back and then I'm gonna try to finish my album and I start another movie. And I'll work all the way through January and in February, Black History Month, I'm lecturing every day. Every day, like 30 lectures in 30, 30 days. So, you know. And this ain't really no lecture, really. I mean, I used to lectures suck. <laughs> no, but it's like it's a chance to get out and try to inspire you motherfuckers to think <laughs> cause some shit. Right? Uh, oh, you already got a question, right? Okay, that was the other guy. <laughs> oh, no, I want to thank you for uh, calling us straight on love. Um, particularly with cops. Uh, I've never gotten anything from cops except cut wrists and beat up. And, uh. and I think they suck in a lot of ways in terms of being an enemy uh, instead of a protector. But um, I want to know, call it straight. You, te you tell it like it is. I, kinda, I tell it like I see it. Yeah, that's fine. And I see it, I see it that way too in a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of instances. But where do we go from here? That's really what I'm worried about. Man, you know what it is? It's kind of like people always ask me, they say, Ice, what are you going to do in the future? I'm like, oh, what's your next record going to be like? Where are you going to go? I'm like, well, if I knew, I'd go there and I'd wait on everybody. I don't, I, I don't really know where we're going to go from here. If I really start telling you where I think we're going to go from here, it'll probably depress the shit out of you. But I really just think that the Earth has a lifespan and in a minute, the shit's going to be over. Now, a minute could be another 100 years. I don't think there's no way out, really. I mean, it's like, you know, you got virus X, you got overkill, you got a lot of situations, you got people at each other's throats, you got the, 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 the basically the ecology, our air is going downhill, the water's polluted. This, this thing is like a muffin and it has a lifespan. It's molding and it's going to die. So how long it takes for it to die, and how we choose to kill ourselves, that we'll see. I mean, I'm not so, so um, cynical that I don't want this place to be good for my child, but 
there's too much of a dark cloud hanging over the earth right now. A lot of it's man-made to make us believe that we're going to figure a way out of this one. It's too much hate, it's too much pain, and, you know, if you study and get up into some of the things that can, you know, basically. And you know what else is really crazy? The earth may just do it. The earth may just do it. I mean, look right down in Nicaragua right now, man. It's fucking the rains, the, the potentials for bomb. You know, I guy was just telling me when I was coming into the school, yeah, we're expecting an eight-point earthquake with a tsunami and a... <laughs> Everybody's expecting to die. It's just kind of like, yo, like Prince said, in 1999, we better just get all the fucking in we can. Because <laughs> shit's not really fixable at this point. I, I, think, I think the main thing you can do is try to have peace of mind and worry about the issues here. If you can get them straight, you've done a major job, you know? But us getting along, Good luck. Don't you think it's that kind of hopelessness, though, that, that keeps people the way they are, and keeps people fucking shit up for everybody else? Well, I, I, I mean, I agree in, in one sense, but then you're dealing with human situations, right? But a lot of the problems we have coming over us, humans got nothing to do with it. Like I'm talking about it. Are you, you're familiar with the potential just for the, it, the flu take us all out? It's a lot of shit is coming up, you know? So I'm just praying to God that we can get along. The best thing that could happen is everybody is getting along, and then the shit just fucking blows up. <laughs> <laughs> but the shit's going to blow up <laughs> soon, which could be a 1,000 years, but it's not going to be here forever. We're, de we're destroying it. Hold on, let me drink some up. Uh... Oh, it's a girl. <laughs> Gotta get out of here for a day, shot a little closer. <laughs>
because she's like, she was basically saying women don't need dick, really. They can land their plan with their index finger. They don't need <laughs> it, but, but she, but that's easy for Roseanne to say because she's a rich woman. Exactly. See, she has another reality that's different than the women that are trying to make it up. It's a cold game, you know? Yeah. Men want you, but uh, believe me, a lot of guys in their lives say that, man, I wish I was a girl, because then I wouldn't have to work. All I have to do is fuck. That's, that's how men look at, because see, a man, a man's ass is, a man cannot get up in the morning, get a free meal, get to the movies, get taken out. We don't get all that. So we have our own little jealousy, and it turns into bitterness after a while, because we're like, damn, you know, how come she gets taken all these places and you guys get trips and we, no, ain't no woman ever bought me salt for a french fry. You know, it's not like it doesn't happen. Well, I'm not that kind of gal. But I'm saying, you've been taken out to the movies. Yeah. Right, but I understand what you're saying. I think about it. Independence as a woman threatens a lot of men. You just gotta have your shit together know what you want, handle your business, and you'll make it. You gotta be able to decide who's the suckers that just wanna get in. It basically right off the top, if you just say, yo, I'm not in this for the sex thing, I'm really trying to do this, I can be beneficial. I say that, you know. And they sneak at it. They sneak at it. I already told you, these men, this is the male yeah, thing. Yeah, I know. They can't help it, because you probably got a cute ass or something. Yeah, I do. That's the problem. like cold, it's cold. A more, an attractive woman has a hard time. Hey, it's not easy anywhere. And I just, all I can say to you, all I can say to you is just get your shit together, handle your business. Eventually you're gonna find a job where you basically show yourself as what you are, a businesswoman. And bottom line, you know, you should even give us uh, your resume because like right now, my company is basically formed mostly of like 80% females. Because I really, I, I, I like women as far as working with them better than men, because women are kind of like different. You guys are different. Like if I was in jail and I called up a female and said, yo, I need you to do this, go get Sean. If I tell Sean to do the same thing, Sean will be like, yeah, I'll get to it. The girl will show up at Sean's house, I said, jail, wake up, come on. Chaz, once you guys decide something has to be done, Shit gets done. Exactly. If I need something done, take it from point A to point B, I give it to a female, it always gets there. Guys can't really become, they don't work good. Why? Because they always trying to fuck. <laughs> so if they taking my package across town and the page goes off, my shit don't get there. <laughs> Women, y'all are different. Y'all more focused and stuff. And I'm, 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 I'm really understanding that. My boy Shawnee's in here somewhere in the cut, but Hook up with us, because we doing some stuff. I need strong sisters and people that make money that can make have, you know, to make more money. money. That's what we jobs. talk about. See, and then me and you can make the money, and then we can have sex with other people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you so like much me. for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. You're beautiful. Now, and then women say, oh, he said she was beautiful. That was her sexist. No, no, that was just because she is beautiful. I don't call, you won't see me call nobody other than beautiful. <laughs> I'ma keep it real. I'ma say, like this guy, this ain't no beautiful. This is like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you about keeping it real. <laughs> nah, you know that's right. But you gotta keep it with your real. Bitch. Okay. My question is, do um, you think there is any chance of a revolution? Oh yeah, by all means. I see some, some crazy days ahead of us. Uh, I don't know what type of revolution it's gonna be, but I was watching this other thing, I was li listening to this other thing, and they were talking about uh, 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 a computer virus that can rip through the computers and put everything on zero. Could you imagine that? In other words, everybody's bank account went to zero, everybody's no one owned anything anymore. All the banks went zero. Everything was zero. Now the only reason you have that house is because you can stay in it. And you got a gun and I can't take it because it's not yours because now the richest person on earth is now broke. And it turns back into who got the power. A lot of things could happen. There's a lot of potential scenarios when, if, like we say, an epidemic hits and there's not enough 
disastrous, but disasters can cause a revolution. People fighting against each other. As far as the human people of the United States rising up against this government, no, I don't think it can be done. The only way it can happen is if the actual military turn on the system, turn on itself. Because, see, as crime escalates, so does law. So if you take over Seattle or Tacoma or whatever, you can beat the cops like we did in L.A. In L.A., we faded the cops during the riots. The cops got the fuck out of L.A. We beat them. The, you know, the streets beat the cops. They bring in, they up the grade. They say, okay, National Guards. If you whoop the National Guards, they bring in the Marines. See, they, they escalate with you. And we're not ready to go to war against our own country unless it would have to be total, total revolution at one time. And the only way it could happen is if the cops themselves went against, see what I'm saying, you'd have to have the, the military turn those fucking cobras against themselves. But no, nah, it ain't gonna happen here. This place is locked down like a big jail and they got the key and they're not gonna let nobody like me, because in order to form a revolution, you gotta have people speak on it. And they, they got every little faction in check and they can wipe that shit out so quick. It's fucked up. And, well, you know, revolution for what? You know, it's, it's over any, any minute anyway. Just just try to find peace in your in your room. Chill. <laughs> but, yeah, hopefully, that's what I think. I don't know. Man. Maybe but we got a couple revolutions coming up. One thing I think, the United States is very arrogant, though. They don't think we can have revolution. They're like, oh, well, we can you know, they have it every place else. But they do have this place scientifically like, locked down. So we can have little coups in states, but never the whole United States. Okay, well, last year, um, I'm sure you know Elaine Brown. Well, I don't know if you know, she came up to UPS, and she, um, I had the pleasure of meeting her and listening to her speak. So I was wondering, um, well, she was one of them. She was a very radical political figure. I was wondering if you consider yourself a radical political figure in, say, the African-American community today. Nah, I just think what I'm like is a contemporary realist. You know? I don't think anything I say is radical. I just think it's real. I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to say anything that's outrageous and far-fetched. I'm just kind of like laying out what really is going on, human nature and stuff. I have no plans or plots to take over or change. I don't know how much change. Ken and I have a dream world when I become an idealist, like what I think the world could be. But I'm also like really much into just saying, hey, I'm, I'm kind of like watching it, I'm looking at the world, I'm saying that you fix it here and a woman opens up here, you fix it here. And I'm kind of like looking at the earth as a big organism. You know, with like ants crawling all over it. It's us, human beings. And, and what makes us so arrogant to believe we are going to live when all everything else becomes extinct and species greater than us have been left this earth? We think we're going to live. I just don't, don't look at it like now. If that theory is radical, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I'm a, I think as far as being a radical spokesperson, no, I just think I'm a a spokesperson, a person who speaks. And in my book, I said, isn't it a, a shame that people put me on a pedestal because I tell the truth? That a bitch, they'll say I'm somebody special just because I tell the truth? That's fucked up. That means, and what I, once again, what I'm here to do is not show you I'm special, is to inspire you, is to make you say, man, I could do what I did, man. I can stand on a stage and talk about what I believe and that's what it's about, man. It's, I mean, who the hell am I to talk to a college campus, man? You could do it. Just, just get some nuts, man. Or women, you know, get whatever you got. <laughs> get it going, my oh, man. Yeah, I don't know. I just, um, I, I just recently came to college a little while ago after being out of school for a couple of years, working in coffee shops and shit like that. And I've, I've been getting a little bit distressed about the idea of um, college, just because it seems like, I don't know, I, in my little idealistic dream state, I figured that college would be a place where you went to kind of expand your mind and open yourself up to new perspectives and new horizons. That's what I thought. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I've just been noticing that a lot of people are just going to college with the idea of putting themselves in a certain career path in order to get to some place and forgetting about 
what they're doing at the present time and forgetting about the people that they are just so that they can get somewhere. Right, let me, I'm going to let you keep talking. One thing I want to, what I always do when I talk to colleges is I tell people in school is when you get out of here and you do graduate, do not turn into the enemy. It's like you guys will be the ones that will make decisions for a lot of the kids that did not go to school. And a lot of nights you guys are up and you guys are studying and your friends not studying. And you got an attitude about that. You get out and this guy needs a loan and this guy needs a job and you could give it to him, but then because you went to college and he didn't, you got a chip on your shoulder. And what you are doing is you are turning into the system. You are the other side. And you're in here and you're right now radical and ready to change the world, but you got to go out there and do it. You can't just get here and then fall into it. Now, I'm part of the system. I've learned how to how to work it and get money because we all need money to, to live. But as long as I don't change my agendas in my head and I speak on what I believe, you haven't changed and stuff. And that's kind of like what you're getting at. You thought, to, but no, you know, another thing is though, a lot of people go to college for different reasons, you know? I mean, I might go to college right now because I want to expand my brain, but other people are here trying to create a life for themselves so that they don't have to go through some of the stuff. A lot of people have issues at home with their families. They're going to be breadwinners. It's a lot of reasons, you know? But, like, you know, always remember what I said earlier. Everybody has a different reality, so you can't hold that against them. Yeah, um, it just kind of seems like um, this, the status quo doesn't want the vast majority of the population to get educated because people just don't want everybody to be educated and intelligent because if mm -hmm. everybody was educated, that would take away the really high paying jobs. No, most definitely. They most definitely, they, they don't want, first thing they don't want, the first thing they don't want is all the races to think the same thing. They do not want me and you to become allies. They don't want me and a Jewish kid or Asian kid or a Latino kid or black. They don't want us all to find out this one enemy here, which is the people that are trying to keep the shit the way it was. You know, they say terms like good old days, tradition. Well, tradition of the United States is the own niggas, right? The good old days, I don't know nothing about no fucking good old days. I had no good old days. I only have the future. See what I'm saying? So there's people that want traditional values and this bullshit. And then they turn around and say, this country was founded on, this country was founded on murder, robbery, rape, and every fucking thing else you can throw in a book. This fuck fucking is a robbed land. But what we do is we, we rip it off, we all the blood, we throw a nice white sheet over all the blood, and then claim the areas, and then try to create law. Fuck out of here. Now, they don't want you to think that, they don't want you to put that idea into your mind, because it throws every fucking thing off. So education is the most dangerous thing, and when we start sitting down and plotting, and you get the whole world together, and if we all got together and people started talking like myself, and we they shoot me. Because they can't allow that. Because then you figure it out. This is a fucked up place. I was in Australia, and I'm in a car with this Aussie guy, and he's like, I'm like, what's in the outback? He's like, oh, you don't want to go out there. He says, uh, they have bunks out there. I'm like, what's a bunk? He said, that's an aboriginal. That's what they sound like when you hit them with the truck. Yeah. Now, what is Australia but a, a, a jail state, right? A, a prison that turned, was turned loose and turned into a country. You know, get to the basis of what this shit is, man. And you got, you got all these issues in the United States. You know, you got the indigenous people of these countries, of this land living in the I Man, shit is fucked up. But inside of all this fucked up shit, let's have sense. Let's have an understanding. Tell me how we're on.